What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to have eternal life? What a question to ask. And to ask Jesus this question? You can't get much better than this. This is the passage that we're reading today. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 25. Let's read it. It is extremely important. Very awesome. A certain ruler asked him, this is Jesus, saying, Good teacher, or rabbi, that would be, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let me stop here for a second. Jesus, right at this point, had the opportunity to say anything he wanted to say. He could have preached the gospel as we hear it today, the modern-day Christian gospel, or as I sometimes call it, the modern-day, actually oftentimes call it, the modern-day corrupt Christian gospel. Jesus could have said, well, all you got to do is just accept me as your Lord and Savior. All you got to do is just confess me that I've, you know, confess me as your Lord and Savior and believe in your heart that I rose from the dead and all will be well with you. He could have said, well, you know, now is different, but after I die and rise from the from the dead, then it'll be it'll be different after that. Okay, so get ready for a change. It's coming in just a little while, just a matter of months or weeks. So you'll be alive, there, ruler. You'll be alive, rich man. You know, when I when I die and and when I rise again from the dead. So let me tell you right now. I'll give you a uh, you know. I'll tell you exactly how to get eternal life. This is how you get born again. This is the sinner's prayer. Jesus had the opportunity to say anything he wanted. If there was a major change coming within weeks, because we know, relatively speaking, this was very close to the crucifixion and also the, um, you know, the resurrection of the Lord. He had all the opportunity right then and there to preach the gospel as we hear it today in modern day evangelical circles. But let's read to see exactly what Jesus really said. Now, remember, these are the words in red. So I encourage you, I know many of you, if not all of you who are listening to to me, you've heard the gospel as it's presented in most evangelical churches or by evangelical preachers where they go out there, they go up there, they preach about how Christ is everything you need and how, you know, your sins have separated you from, from God and how you need to come to Jesus and he will in no way turn you out and turn you away and and that you need to just accept him as your Lord and Savior and you raise your hand at the end you come forward to the to the so-called altar and you say the sinner's prayer and after that you have someone tell you you're born again um, I got news for you almost everybody that goes forward is not truly truly born again I heard the st- statistics and you know this even if I don't get into statistics, you know that not everybody that goes fo- forward, even the vast majority of those who go forward, don't walk away completely changed. You can't get born again unless you die. You can't have another birth unless you die to yourself. You got to die to the old. Someone who's born again is really, you know, what they can, put it this way. If you're really truly born again, you will you will you will be able to say, and not only you, but everybody around you will be will be able to say, the old is all gone. The old sinful self is all gone. There is a complete total change here. All of the old life, the old lifestyle, the old way of thinking, the way I used to think about sin, the way I used to accept sin. Now I'm not like that no more. Now I think completely differently. Now I take God seriously. Every single word that he says, I tremble at his word as it says in the scriptures. Whenever I read the Bible, I just sit there and I tremble at his word because I fear God and I, I just love him and I want to do what is right in his sight because I love him. And all the old is gone. I am crucified with Christ and I've, I've risen with him and I'm a completely brand new creation. I live in the righteousness of, of Christ now and it is, it is, you know, displayed through my works. It is displayed publicly for people to see, not for my own credit, but because that's just the, that's just who I am now. God is shining through me. The righteousness of Christ is like the sun shining in all of its strength. You can't hide it. It's not an invisible thing. 
I know I kind of got off on a little bit of a rabbit trail there, but uh, I, I felt like I needed to say that. So let's get back into the actual context here. Jesus is asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to have eternal life? Awesome question. You can't get much better than that, like I said. Jesus answered, verse 19, let's read it. Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't give false testimony. In other words, don't lie. Honor your father and your mother. You know, these are all commandments that are found in the Torah. Jesus was quoting Torah to him, quoting Torah to him, quoting the commandments of God to him. We can find that in Exodus chapter 20 and also in Deuteronomy chapter 5, okay? So, Jesus, wait a second, wait a second. I want you to clue in here. I want, you to, I want, you, I want something to snap in your spirit here. Wait a second. Jesus didn't preach the modern day gospel. He said, how do you inherit, how do you get eternal life? How do you live forever? Obey the commandments. Obey the commandments. He said, you know the commandments, Jesus said. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Out of all the commandments, this is what Jesus said that you should do to have eternal life. And I, I guarantee you, if you don't get eternal life, you will get eternal death. Not that you will not exist anymore, but yes, you will exist in the state of death and hell eternally. Okay, death is not just totally, completely disappearing and not being, you know, not existing anymore. No, death is a state, is a spiritual state that you don't want to be stuck in for the rest of eternity. You want to have everlasting life. Life, I say. Verse 21, he said, I have observed all these things from my youth up. When Jesus heard these things, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. Again, let me stop here for a second. I can't help to, you know, but to think of the Apocrypha every time I read something like this because the Apocrypha makes it very clear. This is needed. Giving to the poor, giving alms is a necessary commandment. Necessary very, very much mandatory for you by God. And if you don't do it, you're in big trouble. Let's read on. Jesus continues by saying, then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard such things, he became very sad for he was very rich. Jesus, seeing that he become very sad, said how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into God's kingdom. It is easier for a camel to enter through, the, through an eye, a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. Now, this is a very serious passage here, um, and we need to take it very seriously. Jesus commands and demands all, 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 that is. He don't go for second best. He don't want second best. He was offered second best with Cain's offering. You see, Abel offered him the best, the firstlings of the flock, the fat of the flock, whereas Cain just brought any old offering to him. That's why uh, God loved Cain. Abel's offering and favored Abel over Cain because Cain just didn't care. Whereas Abel was, went over and above and gave the best. He wanted God to be well pleased and he did his best for, to please God. So, um, Again, I can't help but think of the Apocrypha. I'm going to get into the Apocrypha, so stick in there. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, make sure you follow me. Make sure you check in uh, multiple times a day if, you, if need be. Check in because I always got new teachings coming up. I always got new things coming up, so don't miss this. But, you know, 
I can't help but think of the Apocrypha, how the Apocrypha talks about um, about giving alms, giving to the poor, and how that in itself can secure your can secure a place in the world to come in everlasting life. This is what the Apocrypha teaches, and this this is what Jesus is saying here. Okay. Listen, before you stop it there, uh, Mr. Uh, Evangelical Christian, Mr. Pastor, Mr. Christian, Mrs. Christian, before you stop the, listening to this teaching, I challenge you to challenge what you've always, what you've heard all of your life because I'm reading the words in red here. I'm telling you what Jesus said. Think about what he couldn't, what he could have said or what he did say. He could have give, given the, like I said, the modern-day evangelical corrupt gospel as we have it today, which is just on so-called grace, which is just counterfeit grace, and so-called faith, which is just a fake faith and false humility. But uh, no, he, uh, he nailed it to the floor. He said, these are the commandments you need to obey. And the guy said, well, I, I obeyed it. Well, okay, you lack one thing. Go, sell everything you got, then give to the poor. Then you will have eternal life. This is the words in red. The, this is the New Testament word. Don't pick out certain words in red. Don't, don't pick out, oh, Jesus said this. I like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But then leave this. Don't cherry pick scriptures. Don't cherry pick scriptures. Just because the words is words in red doesn't mean you should cherry pick them, okay? You know, you don't you don't cherry pick anything, especially from God. Okay. Everything he says, he means. And it says in Psalm 119, his word is settled forever in heaven. Not temporary. There's no temporary, there's no temporary order, no temporary court order in God's sight. There's no temporary order at all. It's all final. It's very important to obey the commandments. And it's also very important to show mercy to other people. It's also very important to rebuke other people of their sin. As it says in Leviticus 19, 19 you shall love your neighbors yourself. And a lot of people like to preach love, but they forget the last half of that verse. You like, you just, you know, you cut the person off halfway in, you know, in, in you cut the sentence in half, basically. The guy's speaking. I mean, you know, it's like the Lord's speaking and you cut him in half. No. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, as yourself. You shall love your neighbor. Do not suffer him to sin, but you shall rebuke him so that you can save his soul from hell. That's what love's all about. That's what love's all about. I know a lot of people say, well, you know what, uh, you know, everybody sins. Eh, no, 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 that's not what the scriptures say. And I'm not going to get into that right now. I've got a lot of teaching about that. So check out my other teachings. Um, if you need, I mean, if you're up to it, check it out yourself in the scriptures. He who sins is of the devil, it says in the scriptures, okay? Luke chapter 1, verse 6, you know, um, John the Baptist's parents were without sin. Paul even said, according to the Torah, I'm blameless in Philippians. Hey, it's possible. Very possible. Many, um, I can't say many, but... Some have attained it. And you can attain it, attain it too. So as you go your way, may God give you strength and blessing and, and just bless you abundantly. Not only just make you feel good. I'm not, praying, I'm not praying for you to feel good, but I'm praying for you to be good in God's eyes, in God's sight, so that you will be blessed forever. And as you call unto him, he will show you great and mighty things. Challenge all that you've heard. Because it could be wrong. And don't think you're so good that everything you've believed before is right. A lot of people think, you know, they don't say this, but their actions show it where it's like, I'm so good, I'm so perfect. Everything I believe, everything that I have ever believed about the gospel and about the Bible and about church, you know, from the church is true. Everything that I've believed from this particular pastor, this particular minister, this particular preacher is true. Everything, everything I know about the Bible is true. You could be wrong. Be humble, okay? Be humble. Be humble. Search the scriptures as the men of Berea did in Acts chapter 17. And as you do, may God give you revelation. And if you're truly honest with God, God will show you 
and he will show you great and mighty things. Thanks again.